Well, good morning, everybody. I will warn you in advance, this was probably the hardest study I've ever had to do. How many of you like history? Mutants, yes, mutant people. Okay, I am not one for remembering dates and facts and figures and numbers and even names, I find now. Uh, so this was a very difficult thing for me because we're going to go through Genesis 10, which is called the Hall of Nations. If you remember in our story plot as we've been going through Genesis, Noah, his sons, their, all of their wives are now off the ark and they're starting a new life. We saw last week some things that happened and uh, we uncovered it. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we go through. But this is basically how all the earth was repopulated. And there are 70 nations that are mentioned here, which we have records on almost all of them. In fact, historians look to the Bible to get the flow of where people grew up and went and how they spread out on the earth so that they might understand things like when you get your DNA checked and they tell you who, whose family you belong to and whether you're related to this one or that one or the other one, they have to go back through the DNA, which is rather interesting. And even the scientists are agreed that there are three progenitors throughout the earth of all the races that are here. Uh, the rest of it was done through... Anyway, I'm getting way ahead of myself. So I will apologize to the rest of you that don't care for history very much. You can just tune out. It'll be okay. I'm sure the Lord understands. Uh, but there's some interesting things that we have to learn. And the reason that this was preserved is to give authenticity to the word of God. The amazing thing is you look at all, you, you know, like you hit Leviticus or, you know, you, you, you go through uh, numbers and you get all these names and begat who and begat somebody else. And, you know, I, I try to imagine what they look like to remember them. And I just, there's just too many. And there's 70 today that I'm going to go through. Uh, God help me. Yes. In the time that we're allotted. Uh, so pray for me in your seat. Uh, pray for me online. My dear wife is home, not feeling well today. Uh, if she's not watching, I'll quiz her when I get home. <laughs> if she's not watching, boy, I'm going to be sorely happy, actually, because uh, I feel like I'm going to blow this. Anyway, let's pray. Father, I thank you for the ability to be here as a family. Those that you've called us out of the world from every tribe and tongue, and you've called us under the grace of your son, Jesus Christ that because we have admitted that we're faulty, sinful, and we've come to you to be our savior, that you have come to meet with us and changed us from the inside out. I thank you, Lord, that you don't put up any barriers between us and you other than just confessing that we have a need for you. So Lord, this morning, I want you to just open our minds and hearts. I pray that you'd help me as I go through. I wouldn't be a total fool. But Lord, that you would be lifted up and seen in all these things, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so as you remember, it's Shem, Ham, and Japheth, which repopulated the world. If you look at the shaded uh, screen before you, that's essentially the areas in which they took over with some exceptions and overlap, and we'll talk about that as we go on. But this is the genealogy of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and sons were born to them after the flood. So last week, we looked at the, th the three um, descendants of Noah who came, and I, I titled this the unwelcome stowaway, and you guys know that the unwelcome stowaway on the ark was actually our sin nature, because it's seen everywhere as we go by. We looked at everything from family dysfunction to drunkenness in this chapter, and if you didn't see it last week, you can go look. Noah, after being a sea captain and after being a contractor, decided to start a new line of work, started planting vineyards, and he drank of the vine and he got drunk. Certainly drinking alcohol is not sinful in and of itself, but too much of anything is not a good thing. Amen? Yeah. Drunkenness is a sin. And so he, he just went off and he finds himself at the end of his mission of being a captain with really no big deal happening in his life. And we tend to lose focus when we don't have a purpose in our life, right? If you don't, I didn't know what day it was when I woke up this morning. And when I woke up or when I, when I heard my alarm go off, 
I shut it off and I said, what day is this? And I was pretty immobile and I was on my way back, back into sleep. <laughs> and I remembered, oh, it's Sunday. <laughs> and suddenly like somebody, clear, poo, I was up <laughs> and moving. It's the power of purpose. It's the power of purpose. If you guys don't keep a schedule, you should. And especially if you're retired, because you can just burn day after day after day. And boy, the TV has a way of sucking you in. The internet has a way of just sucking you in. And you're like, wow, it's three hours? How did I burn three hours looking at this silly thing? It happens. I think that's what happened with Noah. I think he lost his focus. I think he lost his purpose. And because of that, he ended up slipping into this and this thing ended up happening. So it's like us. We always need to be on mission. And so we saw Ham's son walk in, found him in a state of disrepair because he was naked or his nakedness was uncovered in the tent. And we talked at the end what that could, could have meant. And of course, the other two sons were respectful and went in with a covering over their back and backed in to cover their father's nakedness instead of exposing it, instead of talking about it, instead of making a mockery of his father's nakedness, they walked in and covered their father's nakedness. And of course, uh, as Shakespeare once said, to cover or not to cover? You always wonder what, what sins you should cover and what sins you shouldn't cover. Uh, obviously, if you have something against somebody, Matthew 18, Jesus told us, you go to someone, right? You go to the person you have a problem with. You don't tell all your friends, hey, let me tell you, so-and-so, blah, 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 or complaining about so-and-so, blah, blah, blah. That's not how you deal with things, right? And that's not how we deal with things in the church. We go to people, we deal with it, we iron it out. And we looked at Matthew 18 and how Jesus told us to do that. And there's a process to do that. And we can do that within the body of Christ as we're all members of one another, which is uh, very comforting. Well, Noah wakes from his wine and he knew what had happened. He knew what had happened. His son had looked upon his nakedness. And you wonder, well, how did he know these things? You know, And there are all these theories I told you about, and I won't go into them all, but you know what the theories are. And so we talked about that as well. And then he begins to dole out these blessings and cursings and he blesses Japheth and he blesses Shem and he curses Canaan, not Ham. Ham was the guy that walked in and saw him. He curses his son, Canaan, which is peculiar. And I, I took note of that for you. And uh, it, you, you never want to, <laughs> you never want to look into things uh, that you're not supposed to look into. But here, actually, this is a, this is a, a skeletal remains of somebody that was um, at Noah's time. And there are some people that think that it was Noah. He got lost in a basement somewhere and found uh, along with that headstone. So there's some real interesting things out there archeologically and, and the internet's loaded with stuff that's good and stuff that's not so good, but you can find it. I just want to remind you that it says at the end that he died, which is what we all do. I mean, unless the Lord comes to take us home, we're all gonna face our demise in some way, shape or form. I just did two funerals this week. I'll be doing another one next week. And we're probably going to have a memorial for John here at some point in the near future. Funerals are, are something that I see a lot of recently. And there are things that happen. And we're all ticking time bombs. We all have an expiration date. And so we come to the grips that some point we're going to leave this world. And what condition are we going to leave it in? At least our soul. We talked about what it is to uncover someone's nakedness and we looked into Leviticus and what it says and your father's nakedness is actually a term, it's a Hebra Hebraism talking about your wife. And so it may have been that Ham was doing something illicit with his own mother, not a good thing. And so we looked at all of that and discussed it. And so if you want all of the, uh, all of the things, you can take a look at it. Um, so this is like a Jerry Springer's episode, um, what we went over last time. So, so this week, we're going to talk about Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And these 70 nations, there are 14 from Japheth, there are 40 from Ham, and 29 from Shem. If you know anything about these genealogies, you know that there's one line that follows through all of Scripture, and it's the line of Shem. It's where we get the word Semitic from, 
which are the Jewish people. So Shem is actually the first Semitic person. In fact, that's his name. And that's the line in which Jesus the Christ comes and the dynasty back to David and Terah and all of, all of those back, they all come from the line of Shem. And so the Bible takes a big wide view at everything that's going on and then it takes a, a closer view at this and then it takes a closer view at this until we get to the pinnacle of all of history, which is the coming of Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. So we'll take a look at this. Hold on to your seats. I'm going to read names. This is the genealogy of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The sons were born to them after the flood. The sons of Japheth were Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshech, and Tiras. The sons of Gomer were Ashkenaz, there's a good one, Ashkenaz, Riphath, and Torgma, Tagarma. The sons of Javan were Elisha, Tarshish, Kittim, Dodanim, and those and these are the coastland peoples of the Gentiles. They were separated into their lands, everyone according to his language, according to their families, into their nations. And there's 32 verses of this, boys and girls. So hold fast. I'll try to add a little bit of background. Japheth are the Greeks. They were once called the Labatos, which actually is, comes from that word, Japheth. Uh, so Gomer is the Gauls. If you remember in a ancient history, the Gauls, uh, th they were the true Galatians, not Galatia, the city that you guys know of in Asia. Anyway, they're French, okay? So that's where the Gauls came from, the ancestor who is Gomer, uh, and, and also the Simru, which are the Welsh. Magog are the, are the Scythians, which are the Russians. And if you know anything about chapter 38 and 39 of Ezekiel, it, it is coming true right before our very eyes. And uh, there are lots of um, prophecies about Magog, about Meshach and Tubal, uh, all of these nations that will be coming out. So when you look at these old names, you can get all kinds of messed up unless you have a translation and you know who it is, that's Russia. Uh, so anytime you see Magog in there, you know, hmm, I wonder. Does it have something to say for me from this ancient book? The scripture absolutely does. Madai, which actually means middle land or, or middle earth, if you're a Hobbit fan. <laughs> Madai, those were the Medes and the Persians, uh, which is basically Iran. They speak a language called Farsi. It's, it's interesting because Iran and Iraq are always battling with each other. They're actually two different people groups. They have a lot of the same cultures and so forth, but they're two different people groups. And that's why. And so these folks come from Japheth. And uh, you have Javan, who are the Ionians. It's an old name for the Greeks. And so you have all of these folks, and you'll notice they're pretty much in the northern uh, section of what we're talking about. They kind of went north and west, Japheth's family, as they grew. Meshach and Tubal are the Moscovites, where you might recognize the word Moscow. And so those are the people of that area and also Tublisk. And you'll see those also in Ezekiel 38 and 39. They are very prominent in prophecy. Tiras are the Thracians, or maybe even the Etruscans. So there's some of this that's uh, actually fuzzy and foggy, but uh, that's, they're pretty sure of that. They migrated to Italy, and it may refer to the seafaring Pal Palatians of the Aegean coast of the Etruscans of Italy. So those are the Tiras. And they know this because they can trace down the language and they see that it's a root word for some of these names. And so that's how they get it. Um, also, there's Ashkenaz, which sounds like Ashcan to me, but Ashkenaz. Those are your Germans, your Austrians, your Polans, uh, your Polish. Uh, so that's kind of Eastern Europe. And that's that's what you have. The, if you know the, anything about the Jewish culture, you have two different groups of Jews. You have the Ashkenaz Jews, which are from this area. And then you also have the, um, I know I wrote it, I, Sephardic. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm always cautious to say that word because it sounds almost like something not good. But the Sephardic Jews, which are from Spain and Portugal. So, so you have kind of the elite um, 
the elite ones and then you have the other ones. And there's always some friction between the two because they're from two different worlds. And if you remember, there was quite a Jewish population actually in Germany until 1942 when Adolf Hitler rose to power and decided he would exterminate the Jews. So that's, that's the difference between the, the Ashkenaz, Ashkenazis and the Sephardic Jews, which are from Spain and Portugal. If you, if you look at them, you can tell that they actually look different. I don't know why I'm telling you this, you don't care. So you have two different groups. Um, and then you have Torgma, which are the Turks, uh, which is Turkey, as you might know it. And so much of this historical data was recorded by Herodotus in the fifth century BC and in Josephus, uh, Josephus Fla Flavius. I want to say flavor. To the Jesus, can I have the, the vanilla and the Josephus flavor? <laughs> Josephus Flavius. So, and he was around Jesus' time, wrote as a Jewish historian working for the Romans. So uh, a lot of these, the background that you find here, this is where it comes from, just in case you were wondering, how does he find all this information? Well, there's a lot of ancient texts that you can look up. So the sons of Javan are two, two geographical names and two tribal names, all kins to the Greeks. So Javan uh, become the Greeks, the Ionians. Elisha, which is Cyprus in Greece. Tarshish, which may have been the British Isles. Uh, and this is how they figured this out. They knew that from history, Tarshish was a source of tin and British Isles were always known for their tin. And so there's this place they used to go to get tin all the time that had this name. And they said, okay, well, maybe that's what it is. Uh, but Tarshish may also include Spain. Uh, if you remember Tarshish, you know, there was uh, Jonah had an incident from Tarshish. Uh, he, he had a well of a time. So he, he was there. And then um, there's also Paul the Apostle, if you remember. It's Tarsus, actually. It's a change. They changed some of it, but it's essentially the same place. Um, and you have a lot of that as time goes on, as names are changed. And you find people that move into an area and they take it over. They tend to rename it, but it's not so far different. They just kind of make it their own. Um, you have Kittim, which is Cyprus, and the Macedonians, and you have Dodonim, which is Dodona, or Greece, uh, the island of Rhodes. And I'm sure all of you knew that. <sighs> okay, God help me. All right, verse 6. The sons of Ham were Cush, Mezraim, Put, Canaan. The sons of Cush were Seba, Havilah, Sabta, Rama. Sabteca, and the sons of Ramah were Sheba and Dedan. Cush begot Nimrod. Any of you know Nimrod? Yeah. Tell him I said hi when you see him. <laughs> Cush begot Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erik, Achad, Cana, or Kalna, I'm sorry, in the land of Shinar. So they, in their transportation uh, across, Cush is Ethiopia or Babylonia. And you can see I, I pulled up a map with very small writing for you so that you can read. Um, and these are a little harder to read in here. But uh, Cush is right here over, over in the, the uh, African continent. So Cush is Ethiopia, Babylonia, and even India as they went out. And then Mez Mezrim, uh, you'll find in Genesis and Chronicles, the, the progenitor of the various Egyptian tribes. So Egypt was called the land of Ham for a long time, and you can find that in three of the Psalms listed there. The Philistines also came from Mezrim, and you find that in Genesis 10:14, which we're looking at. And two capitals of Egypt were Memphis and Thebes, if, uh, if you guys do any reading, you might recognize those. Put, it's an interesting name. Put, I, 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 always, I always remember this because the guy that it was in Put, we gave him the foot. Put, the progenitor of all the Libyans and other tribes in North Africa, and it, basically Libya. Remember Momar Gaddafi? Oh, sorry, okay. Yeah, I know, I'm not a big history guy. I'm just trying to tough it out through this stuff. But it is the word of God. So, uh, you'll, you'll find all of these things verified in Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and Nahum. Canaan, you probably recognize this immediately. Palestine, Arabia, Tyre and Sidon, and other parts of the land promised to Abraham. 
the, these nations are often mentioned in connection with Israel, as you see throughout, and especially during Joshua's uh, coming into the land, they were like the number one people to beat, the Canaanites. And they would go in and they would, you know, take out a bunch of them, but they didn't take them all out. So what would happen is they would rise to power and come back and, and bite them. And they'd have to rise up and take them again. And then they would just, they'd get three quarters of the way done and then they would just say, call it quits. And the Lord said, take them all out. Take them all out because they're, they're going to come back and they're going to kill you. It's, uh, it, it's like having a, a rabid dog in your house. You know, you just, you just can't do it. And all of the other nations, Havilah, which is Arabia, Sabta, which is on the Persian Gulf, the Western shore. There's R Rama, which is Arabia. There's Sabteca, which is Southern Arabia. I had to type all this out. I hope you appreciate this. Sons of Rama are Sheba, which is the Southwest Arabia, the Queen of Sheba, as mentioned in First Kings. You might remember that. Uh, so that's over in Arabia where the Queen of Sheba came to hear Solomon's wisdom. You've got Dedan, which is northern Arabia, and some of the people in these ancient kingdoms trace their lineage to Joktan from Shem, which is the other guy. And so there was a mixing of the settlement. And you have that when you have people groups that mix together, uh, especially in America. We're all mixed up, right? Amen. I'm like Heinz, you know, uh, 81. I'm, I'm, I'm all, I'm... I'm every man, you know, I'm every, I'm everyone, actually. I've been from everywhere. And so we finally get to Nimrod. Nimrod. Why, why would you name your kid Nimrod? I don't know. We used to, as kids, we used to make fun of each other and call each other that. You stupid Nimrod. I don't know why. Somebody in Sunday school just decided they would coin a phrase and that's what we do, just making fun. So Nimrod is this, it's actually interesting, there's a lot of historical text about Nimrod and Assyria and even Babylonia where all of this comes out of this area and they become these ruthless people. Uh, they figure out new ways to, to kill people and torture them and uh, there's a lot of ancient texts and uh, I just read the interpretations of them, I don't read the originals, but uh, Nimrod was said to be this mighty one on the earth, and he was a mighty hunter. That word before is an unfortunate translation. It's against. He's a mighty hunter against the Lord. And what he ends up doing is he becomes a hunter of men. He's not a hunter of animals. He's not this great, you know, you know with a bow over his shoulder. And he hunts men. He starts taking people out if you don't do things his way. Sounds like maybe somebody you know. Somebody in the world you might know. But Nimrod is this character, and it's interesting. He's the guy that begins Babel, or the Tower of Babel, which we're going to get to next week. He begins this kingdom, and he makes all of these cities everywhere, and everybody's under his authority. And because if they don't, he, he makes sure he takes them out. Like people trying to escape Russia, and you bomb your own people. Sorry. Sorry. I just, it just kills me. Putin, are you listening? <laughs> anyway, so they do this in the land of Shinar, by the way. It's up here, and you probably can't see, but it's right over in here, Shinar. Uh, so some of these people are actually uh, spread out. Nimrod, his Hebrew name is Marad, or Rebel. That's his name, Rebel. Uh, I, I wanted to get a picture of... You know, I wanted to get born to be wild playing and, and get some biker, you know, with bugs in his teeth. That's what he was. That's what his name means. It means rebel. And it points to some violent and open rebellion against God. Nimrod began to be a mighty one on the earth by bold and daring deeds. His rebellion is associated with the beginning of his kingdom and suggests that his hunting and mighty deeds were related primarily to hunting men by tyranny and force. That's what unchecked power does, doesn't it? It corrupts people. He lorded it over others, hunting and destroying all who op opposed him in his despotic rule over people. I believe Nimrod is a forerunner of the Antichrist in the end times, and he was the first world dictator, and the Antichrist, and the Antichrist will be the last one. So here's this shadow, like a foreshadowing of what's to come. And we've had 
those who have the spirit of Antichrist all throughout history. And they're kind of types and shadows leading up to the ultimate one world ruler who's coming. I believe he's probably on the earth now and he's biding his time until he gets put into position. So um, buckle your seatbelts. At the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Achad, and Kalna, and the land of Shinar. And from that land went Assyria and, and, and Nineveh, Rehoboth, Ur, and Kala, and Rezin between Nineveh and Kala. And this is uh, the principal city. So these are all the cities that he started. So it wasn't just one. He's, he's now kind of collecting them all. It's like a game of Monopoly. And he's got all of these towns, very significant towns, going in. We're going to take a closer look at this in the next chapter when he builds the Tower of Babel. So he's the first ruler that you might say has a kingdom because he's kind of invented the word king now. And he's the guy who's in charge of all of this. So um, the, the Kalna is the fortress of Nu, which is Babylonian, but got captured by the Assyrians in the 8th century BC near Aleppo. I'm, I'm sure you pass by Aleppo often. Uh, you, anyway. Yeah, these, these are places far, far away from me. It's hard for me to get attached. Mizraim begot Ludim and uh, Anamim, Lahabim, Naphtuhim, Pathrasim, and Kaslehim, from whom came the Philistines and the Kaftorim. So the Philistines come out of there. That's what I, when I read through that, that's what I get. So Ludum is Egypt. Ammon is Amnon uh, or Ammon. You probably recognize the name Ammon or the Ammonites because they were the people that came out. Um, Lahabim is, are the Libyans again. Uh, and then there's Naphtahim, which is the, which are those people here, the trogl Troglodai. Anyway, yes, more names. I know, I'm sorry. But you've, got, you've got the delta, the, the delta of Egypt, you've got Egypt, you've got the Philistines that come out of the Philistine. Well, that makes sense. You know, they didn't change their name too much. And there were constant plague, frequent oppressors of the Israelites whose history may be seen at large in the books of Samuel and Kings. And so if you go there, you'll see that. And also Cyprus is mentioned. So there are all of these countries, but that's not all. Canaan begat Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth. And the, the Jebusite, the Amorite, the Girgashite, the Hivite, the Archite, the Sinite. By the way, the Sinites go to, um, are the Oriental peoples. The Arvadite and the Zemurite and the Hamathite. Afterward, the families of the Canaanites were dispersed. And the border of the Canaanites from Sidon as you go toward Gerar, and as far as Gaza, which you may remember is the Gaza Strip, then as you go toward Sodom and Gomorrah, which is uh, near, the, near the Dead Sea, Adama and Zeboim, as far as Lasha, these were the sons of Ham, according to their families, according to their languages, in the lands and in their nations. So there you have them there. Um, the, the Canaanites, uh, the, the Heth, actually the Heth, brings about the Hittites, which were huge, and they were part of the Canaanites and got mingled in. They were there for um, like a thousand years. Uh, the, the principal cities of the Hittites were Carchemish uh, on the Euphrates and Kadesh on the Orontes. Uh, so th here's where they settled. So here's all those people. Have you had enough? Are you thirsty for more? So here are all these ites. The tick bites, the laminites, the mosquito bites, they're, they're all in here. <laughs> These guys were all over in the Canaan area. And basically, Ites is, is not a progenitor any longer. He's talking about nations now. He's talking about those who came from, like the Ammonites are those from Ammon. So, uh, you know, if, if the Grams have kids, they're Gramites. No. We, just, we just start making up names as we go along. It'll be fun. So that's where all of these folks are. And you'll, you'll hear them prolifically throughout the Old Testament that they're the enemies of Israel and they're always causing them trouble uh, and certainly being able to speak. Shem, now we're gonna get into Shem. Aren't you, aren't you thrilled? Look at this, this is a shortcut. Ready? 
No, I not explain. I sum up. And the children were born also to Shem. And that, that's a good thing. The father of the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth, the elder. So now we know who's oldest. Japheth is older. The sons of Shem were Elam, Ashur, Arphaxad, Lud, and Aram. The sons of Aram were Uz. Now you might know a guy from Uz. Abraham, Hull, Gether, and Mash. I, I have these things go off in my head. Arphax said, begot Salah, and Salah begot Eber. By the way, take note of Eber. Eber is the first guy, and this is where we get the name Hebrew. Eber becomes Hebrew, which means crossover, because they were always crossing over something, Right? They were getting out of Egypt, they were crossing over the Red Sea, or they were crossing over the, yeah, and they, and they were called Hebrews, which is crossover, but uh, it all comes down from Eber, by the way. To Eber were born two sons, the name of one was Peleg. For in his days the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. So you have these two brothers, and they kind of stop this whole thing and say, oh, by the way, he was named that because, it, which, which means split, because the earth was divided. Now, the word earth is the word that we use, earth, which doesn't mean the people of the earth. It means the earth itself. So if the earth was divided at that time, what do you suppose that sounds like? That sounds like, that sounds like continental drift. That sounds like something, you know, all the animals and all the people, they got where they were supposed to, and the Lord just said, ah, I'm going to make some room here. And suddenly there's some seas between. So, and there's, there's a lot of conjecture on that as to whether that's what it is. But it is that the earth was divided, not the people of the earth. The earth itself was divided. So uh, that's, at least from what I read, that's what everyone says. So, I, I, you know, I wasn't there, so. Joktan begot Almadad, Selef, and Hazmareph, Jera, Hadram, Yuzel, Dikla, Obel, Abimel, Sheba, ooh, Sheba, I recognize that one. Ophir, by the way, there's gold in Ophir, and Havilah, and Jobab. <laughs> Good old Jobab. And there were the sons of Joktan, and their dwelling places was from Mesha as you go toward Sephar. Now, if you happen to go to Sephar, you'll know. The mountain on the east. And there were the sons of Shem, according to their families, according to their languages, their lands, according to the nations. These were the families of the sons of Noah, according to their generations, in their nations. And from these, the nations were divided on the earth after the flood. Whew. 32 verses. Yeah. You have, to un you have to understand the significance to all of this. There's history behind all of these names and all of these places. And you begin to understand some of the tensions in the world between the different people groups. You have the people of Shem that are against the people of Ham. You've got the people of Japheth, which are against the people of Shem. You have all of, all of this going on and something as close as Iraq and Iran, two different people groups that are always, always fighting with each other. Unless they're fighting against the Jews, then they're like, yeah, yeah, we hate the Jews, yeah. And then they're, they're together. But they're always against each other. And they're two different people groups. I, I've learned to value this because this shows the authenticity of the scripture. And as you go back and you look into the history and you go, oh, yeah, there was a guy named Nimrod. Where did I hear about that? In Sunday school, I think. Nimrod. Yeah, he really exists. The Assyrians and the Babylons come from that. And you can check out their history and go all the way back and People won't necessarily tell you in the history books, but every single thing written in this chapter is dead on. It's dead on. Oh, you know, it's, it's the Bible. It's written by men. It's full of flaws. Not this chapter, that's for sure. And so it's something that's trustworthy. I wonder, do you know who you're related to? Did you ever do one of those, you know, Ancestry.com things and figure out where you come from or where your people come from? It's an interesting thing. I, I associate with everyone. I'm part Irish, so that makes it good on St. Patty's Day. Um, you know, some people think I'm Italian. I have no Italian in me whatsoever. Now, if I was Carl Vitali, 
it would be right. But understanding where you're from uh, really is a value. I think it's an incredible value to find out where you're from and to understand some of the history of that. But what's even better than that is to know that I'm related to Jesus Christ as an adopted child. And all of my messed up background and all your family dysfunction can just get washed away because the Lord Jesus Christ can do that and make you a new creation in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. So, I did want to do something. The reason that this is hugely important, because to go from Adam to Noah to Abraham to King David and to go all the way down the family tree to Jesus Christ... It's an interesting thing to see that he's related to David, not just through Mary, but through Joseph. Joseph was kind of the surrogate father. He wasn't the true father. He was just the guy that kind of raised him for a few years. We don't know exactly how many. But it's interesting that he has the legal right to be related to David, and he also has the maternal right because he's the, the descendant of Mary, at least in the flesh. And so that's how we know that Jesus is the Messiah and the possibilities of anybody else being able to be fulfilled in prophecy. All of this is just astronomical. It could never happen. So that is probably the hardest chapter I've had to teach through and try to keep your attention without being too silly. Next week, we're going to talk about the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel, which I call the, the big man plan. This is, this is when... Nimrod decides he's going to make a tower. Babel actually means gateway to heaven or stairway to heaven, if you wish. <laughs> but they were building it, not buying it. So we're going to talk about that next week.